Okay, so the format of tonight's event is going to be a series of three talks followed by a question and answer. And lots of you have put forward questions and topics that you'd like us to cover. So thank you very much for that. And you can also post questions in the chat as we go along and our panel will do their best to cover as many themes as they can. Though due to the time that we have, we won't be able to cover everything this evening um, and we won't be able to look at um, questions that aren't relating specifically to nutrition. So if you do have any questions on modulators more broadly or on any other subjects, we would encourage you to speak to your CF team or your child CF team. And you can also contact the Trust Helpline. And if, again, if I could ask one of my colleagues to put a link to the helpline in the chat. So we do have quite a high number of registrations tonight, and I know in the audience we have a mix of people with CF, but also parents and carers and CF professionals. And I think that really speaks to how significant a topic this is, both for people who are living with cystic fibrosis, but also those providing care and treatment. So I hope you all find this a really interesting and informative session. And I'm now going to hand over to our chair for this evening, Rob Dixon. So thanks very much, Rob, and over to you. Thanks, Jacqueline. And uh, yeah, welcome to everyone tonight. Uh, so yeah, my, my name's Rob and I'm an adult living with CF. Um, and just this weekend, I celebrated my second Capri anniversary, which was, uh, was good fun. So um, if the last two years have taught me anything, it's that Capri has had a huge impact on my life. And so I'm really looking forward to the talks going to hear tonight particularly focusing on how capturing and other modulators um, might impact um, nutrition and diet um, within CF, both in adults and children. So um, without further ado, I think we'll I'll introduce our first guest speaker, um, Jacqueline, uh, another Jacqueline, uh, who's a <laughs> paediatric dietitian. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Rob. Thank you. I'll just um, get my talk up. Okay, so um, I'm a paediatric dietitian. I'm based at Leeds Children's Hospital, although I have worked in two other centres across the UK, having previously worked in Cardiff and uh, Manchester, so I may know some of you in the audience this evening, so hello if I do know you. Um, and I also um, co-chair the CF Dietitians Group, along with um, Kerry, who is also one of our speakers this evening. So we've been asked to talk this evening on the effects of the modulators on um, nutrition. Um, I've just listed there some of the, what, the ones that we're presently using um, and the CFTR modulators that are often known as, although some people are actually still now calling them variant specific therapies. So you may see them being referred to as VSTs. Obviously in children, we haven't had um, as wide experience in adults because they've not been available as much. So the data that is out there on children is limited compared to adults. But what I'm going to do this evening is take you through what we know so far and also share with you some of my personal experience as well and help to try and answer these questions. So I'm going to present to you the area, the main areas that in the literature at the moment are looking at weight and height and body mass index in children. Also pancreatic function or enzyme, pancreatic enzyme requirements, which most of you will probably be, know as Creon, um, and look at the evidence there, because I know there's lots of questions about, about that. I also want to look at um, vitamins, because people have lots of questions about vitamins and how these new drugs are affecting vitamin levels and vitamin doses. And then just to think about future considerations um, in pediatrics, looking at the diet. So if we first start looking at weight and height, um, there was some research that was presented in 2020 um, by um, a lady, Bailey et al. And what has been very definitely highlighted is that the effect that these new drugs have on weight and height and, and growth in children is very dependent on the genetic mutation and the type of modulator um, that you're on, whether it's or can be or CAF trio. And certainly to my, um, experience today, I've certainly seen much improved weights and heights on calf trio compared to or can be. So it really does depend on the type of modulator and also on your or your child's genetic mutation for the CF. However, if we look at some of the other literature, um, the research that's been done these 
first two ones, um, increased weight and height and increased weight and body mass index, they've been um, looked at children on Caladeco, the Ivacafta, because obviously that was the first um, modulator that came out. So most of the research in children is based on this one. And what the research has shown to date that there has been improvements in weights and heights in children, and, and also weight and body mass index in children on um, Caladeco. However, as we've now got children on CAFTRIO, um, there is increasing evidence now to show that CAFTRIO is having the same effect. Um, and there's been a couple of studies published in 2019 um, in adolescence, because obviously CAFTRIO was first introduced at 12 years of age, although we have now got it down to six years. That's only been for this last um, year. But there has been shown improvements in body mass index in adolescents on CAFTRIO. Um, but all the studies obviously are, are you know, in the early stages um, and as we progress with longer being on CAFTRIO and introducing at a younger age, we'll obviously hope to um, gather more information. Um, and from my experience, certainly I've seen in massive improvements in growth on children and my CAFTRIO. There's also been some research um, looking at um, the obesity and overweight in children. And I know there's a lot of talk about this and much more research in adults, but in children at the moment, it is limited. But what we have seen um, as a study that was published last year is that the number of children from five and a half years and over who became overweight has increased from nine to 18%. So it's, it's doubled in children overweight. However, at the moment, the rate of obesity is the same in children. So it hasn't gone up, unlike what Kerry will present in adults. And obviously that again is for a number of reasons. First of all, the, the period of time that children have been on in new drugs, CAFTRIO has only been introduced in the last year. And as I suspected early on, we, as we suspect, it's slightly different in children because we still have, children are still growing. We've still got the growth factor. Whereas adults, you tend to you know, stop growing, you're just gaining weight. Um, and certainly from what I've seen in my clinic is, um, not just weight gains, but I've seen significant height gains in children um, in my clinic. So I think what we're finding is that although we thought some of our children were growing really well, we actually weren't reaching their height potential. And with the new um, phase, the new era now of these new drugs, we're actually seeing um, children in the clinic who are actually attaining their height potential. They always would have been there, but we just didn't realise that. And I think that's maybe why in childhood, the rate of obesity hasn't increased because we've got the we're reaching a you know a higher height potential. The CF registry report has just come out in the last month. And um, if we do look at that compared to last year's data compared to the years before, we are seeing, however, an, a median increase in body mass index for male and females, and that has increased. So that will be interesting to see the trend of that over the next few years. So what's the reason for this? Why are we seeing increased weight gains? Well, there's, again, there's not a lot of research out there, but what we do know is um, a study that was published in 2018 is showing that there has been a decrease in resting energy expenditure of between five and a half to 12%. Now resting energy expenditure, and it's a term as dietitians we use, that's the energy, that's the calories you need to burn up just sitting at ease, you know, what your body needs to actually use. So we are seeing a significant reduction in that on these new drugs. So basically, um, we're not in CF, we're not needing as much calories um, in order to do get about your daily living activities. We also know that increased appetite has been shown, particularly on CAFTRIO, and so is increased calorie intake. Um, and there was a study that was published in 2019 that showed that patients um, on IVACAFTA had an increased fat and calorie intake significantly higher. Um, on this drug. So again, increased appetite, maybe just feeling better. So you, you, you want to eat more. There's been thoughts that maybe is this due to improved absorption? I'm going to move on to that, but we don't actually know that yet. But that is another um, fee that's been put forward, but much more research is required um, to look at that. So what do we know about um, pancreatic function and increased absorption? Well, there was um, a 
you know, if the, these studies have been done looking at children on Ivacaf journal, and what they've shown is that some children, and I stress the some children, which goes back to the first slide, saying it really does depend sometimes on what your mutations are, but some children on Ivacaf have shown an improvement in their pancreatic function, in their absorption. And for some, again, they've stopped their pancreatic enzymes. Also, what the research is saying is that the earlier you start a modulator, it might reverse the, in, the existing need for pancreatic enzymes, or it might prevent or just delay further damage in young children. But it really is very early research. We need more long-term studies. But evidence is showing that possibly for some children, the earlier these modulators are started, this might reverse pancreatic damage and they may either not need enzymes or it might delay the need for enzymes or require a reduced amount of enzymes. And I've been seeing some of that in my clinic um, with, my, with my patients. Um, I've had um, children, toddlers who were starting on Cambi at two years of age and two, three years on, they're still on the same dose that they were on at two years of age, even though they're on a much larger intake of fat in much larger portions. So I am seeing some of that evidence. The one other area that we get lots of questions about, and there's some data, is the um, vitamins and what vitamin levels are and doses. So I pulled out three studies. Um, this one was published in 2020, and it was looking at Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor. It was um, for one year, and it was a, a large patient number, 845 patients. And it was adolescents and adults. And what they found was that um, vitamin A and vitamin E levels, sorry, vitamin A levels increased significantly, although it was still within the normal range. They found the vitamin E level reduced significantly, although it's still within the normal range. And the vitamin D levels also reduced significantly, but they found they were to be low to normal. Um, now, obviously, a lot of these studies, it depends on, you know, what is patient, you know, what people's compliance with their vitamins are, how good at they're taking their pancreatic enzymes to help with absorption. But it's interesting to see that we are seeing a bit of a trend in some of the vitamins being um, changing. Um, another study that was published last year, um, again on Lumacaftor, Ibacaftor, and this was two years, so a longer study, but less numbers, 41 patients, and that was a mixture of adults and children. Again, they found vitamin levels increased significantly, although they were still within the normal range. And um, the vitamin E levels had reduced significantly, but still within the normal range, and they saw no change in vitamin D levels. Again, I think some the confusing thing with vitamin D levels are obviously we get quite a bit of vitamin D from sunlight, so it may not always be due to supplementation. It may depend on whether you've, you know, you've been sitting in the sun or being on a nice holiday abroad somewhere. And the third study that was published last year, but this was only they only looked at vitamin D, and it was patients on um, Trakafta or Caftrio. It was one year. They were had seventy six. Um, people enrolled in the study and it was a mixture of adults and adolescents and what they found was the vitamin D level increased significantly. There are also a number of abstracts um, presented at conferences and also a number of case studies have been reported but the results are mixed. Some report no changes, some have said they've got increased vitamin A and D levels and some have reported um, excess high vitamin A levels. There was two case studies that were reported of um, children with um, hypervitaminosis A, so excess vitamin A levels. Um, and certainly speaking to dietitians across the UK, we are finding that if, if the vitamins go up, it do, does generally tend to be the vitamin A level that we're finding for some reason. We, we don't know why, why that one is going higher. I've had, um, in my experience, um, a number of um, adolescents who are on Caftrio who have had high vitamin A levels, and we're just making sure that we're checking them regularly. It's been quite useful because for the first year, we have to do um, blood tests every three months. Um, so we've been rechecking the vitamin A levels to make sure they're not going excessively high. And we're obviously um, bringing the doses down of the vitamin A's 
um, as we get in high levels. Um, and I think this has been reported um, nationwide in dietitians, and so much so that one of the companies who makes one of the vitamins specifically for CF has actually reduced their vitamin A dose in their tablet um, based on dietetic feedback, the dietitians feeding back about the high vitamin A levels. So companies are looking at that um, and looking at the trends in that and that and making changes to their vitamin um, supplementations based on the evidence that we're finding. Again, it could be the fact that, you know, improved absorption. We don't really know why and why it's vitamin A that we're seeing that's maybe the ones the high vitamin A, we don't actually know. So what does all this mean looking forwards um, in as a paediatrics perspective? Well, obviously, as dietitians, we, we always monitor weight gain um, and BMI closely. So I think that will continue. Um, I think we obviously as pediatric dietitians seeing what's happening in the adult clinic, we need to make sure that we're not um, causing our children to gain excess weight. But at the same time, we don't want to re reverse things either. We've got, you know, we're getting some amazing growth and weight gain. And I think as pediatric dietitians, we also have to be very mindful that we've got the growth factor going on in the height gain. And from my experience, I've seen improved height gain. So I don't want to, as it is through the, the the baby out with the bathwater. I don't want to make too many changes, but we do need to make be aware that you know for the adults are on these diet and drugs that are gaining. You know the BMI is increasing. I think we need to rethink, and we have to be fair to dietitians. I think we have been thinking about this for a number of years, as looking at the CF diet. It's you know there's a, a legacy of a CF diet being energy dense, so lots of calories, lots of fat, and poor in nutrients. And I think even more now, we need to make sure that that is not the case. And we need to look at maybe quality more rather than the quantity in, in the diet and looking at maybe more closely such things as increasing fiber, choosing more, more appropriate types of fat. And, you know, to quote, make a quote there, the diet in CF is a very individual matter. And we, we've, again, we've known that for a number of years, but I think more so with this specific drug treatment, it is very individual and each patient, you know, will be different for their dietary requirements. We will need to continue to monitor vitamin levels very closely and particularly vitamin A um, and also to continue to monitor pancreatic enzyme dosing and, and requirements. And listen, I think as well, listening to our patients about what they feel is happening with them and whether they need to be looking at, do they need to be reducing the pancreatic enzymes? At the moment, we're not making any changes because we've got no guidance on that. But I think what we need to do is listen to our, what our families are telling us um, and uh, make adjustments accordingly on an individual basis. Um, so that's summing up from a paediatric perspective. Um, I hope that's given you some background to some of the research that's out there and where we're coming from. We've got as many questions as, as yourselves. What I'd like to do now is to hand over to Kerry, who will be discussing this from an adult perspective. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks, Thanks Jackie. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll hand, hand on to Kerry. But, um, uh, I just wanted to say that that was a really interesting talk that um, I was really struck by just how much research has happened so quickly um, in response to um, you know these much later coming out, particularly in in the paediatric community, where so we know the um, the drugs take a bit longer before they're licensed yes. at those younger ages. So um, yeah, yeah, no, it's very exciting to wait and see what the research comes out with next. Definitely. Mm. Brilliant, thanks. So yes, I'll well, hand over to to Carrie now to hear similar thoughts, but from an adult perspective this time. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, and thank you for inviting me to come and speak with you all this evening. Um, I am Kerry Watson and I'm the clinical lead CF dietitian in adults at King's College Hospital in London. Um, and as unfortunately, we've only got 15 minutes this evening. So I've tried to do a brief comprehensive view of everything that we have seen in adults. And obviously we've had a good proportion of time over and above what the pediatrics have experience so far. So hopefully this will touch on some of your queries this evening.
So I just wanted to give a, a bit of a brief summary. I mean, a lot of you know about this, um, is that obviously we've had a BMI target. We've had something that we benchmarked against and, and we tried to strive for. And this is based on data um, in America that showed us that actually the close association between nutrition and the lung function and increase in, with an improvement of BMI, so looking at a BMI of 22 for females and 23 for males, showed that there was an optimization of that lung function. However, what we didn't know is, and what we don't see now, is that actually this lung function doesn't seem to keep on that trajectory or that trend going past a BMI of 25 and, and definitely possibly considering that it might drop down further on. So the CF diet, as Jackie said, was around high energy, high um, calories, high fat. We looked at um, having to bring in the fat soluble vitamins and we definitely looked at a low fiber kind of concept to prevent that fullness from fiber. So really looking at that lower quality of diet and also this mindless approach. Um, and this is really important as we've always, as dietitians, nagged our patients to eat as much as they can, when they can, not even thinking as to whether they were hungry or not. Um, and that's really quite marked now. Um, and so we need to really rethink this um, going forward and with the changes that we have seen. So just looking at some of the evidence, um, some of the data as Jackie has said as well, is that we're still waiting on some of that data. So there's new data, there's studies coming out. Um, and in particular, we saw one come from M. Peterson in America showing that actually they looked at pre-treatment with their triple therapy and then post-treatment after a year. And as you can see, there's definitely um, a change from the normal weight where we see this underweight reducing, this normal weight still in a good position, but definitely coming down, but the overweight and the obese significantly increasing. And which was quite timely with the CF Trust Registry report coming out recently. Um, I'd been sitting trying to find graphs and, and this has done it perfectly for us. If you look at, um, this is in adults from the age of 20 to the age of 50, Plus, looking out at the years 2018 pre kind of the triple therapy, and although we know that, you know, um, I've CAFTA had significant increases in weight and BMI, it was in a slightly different mutation. And so we know that obviously the different mutations and the different modulators have a different impact. But we can see how the, the undernutrition changes dramatically over time, and as does this overweight. So that BMI of 25 and above to 29.9 and how that obese section has started to increase. And particularly, although it doesn't look like it's changed terribly much in this older age group, there is that adjustment and definitely a lower um, amount of undernourishment. So additionally, we need um, to look at body composition and there have been studies done across the board now with a few more coming in with the triple therapies, but definitely there's been quite a few studies looking at the body composition. So that's how your body is made up um, of fat mass, skeletal mass, and muscle mass. And there was data looked at either CAFTA where adults showed that their BMI and weight had increased, but so had their, their fat mass and their fat-free mass. And then we've looked at studies that have shown that actually with that increase in weight and BMI, we've seen a significant increase in that fat mass, but no change in that fat-free mass, so that muscle mass. And that is essentially what we're needing. We need that muscle mass to help with our lung function, to help with most daily functioning. We also know that there was um, some studies done, again, by Peterson and her colleagues, looking at cardiometabolic parameters. So this is um, where we look at blood pressure, um, the lipids, and how that might impact on their, their heart in the long run. And they looked at, um, blood pressure kind of pre-treatment and then post um, a year of, of CAFTRIO, sorry. And there was definitely a significant increase in raised blood pressure. And in some of the diabetes patients where they, unfortunately they didn't get a whole screen of patients um, in a study done in Washington showed that actually there was a lipid increase. So cholesterol and triglycerides were starting to increase. Again, the data is very limited and hopefully we'll start to see more of this data coming out as more centers and um, are get, able to get, get data, apologies. So what have we seen from a glucose tolerance point of view? And, and I think there was this wish that um, 
we would see that we could reduce our insulin intake, um, that patients would be able to come off insulin. And again, it's been very variable. Um, and yet there's no significant change in those patients, excuse me, those people with CF um, that had CF-related diabetes, that there is still this need for insulin. However, there are some changes in the actual glucose excursion. So that rise in the blood glucose um, and how quickly it comes down. So that has been lowered slightly. Um, and additionally, there was a, a change in the fasting glucose when they looked at that in the in the modulator treated pe people with CF. So there might be these changes in the glucose excursions, um, but it's still too early to say as to whether there will be a reduction in that CF related diabetes, which is something we did see in the IVACAFTA data that there was a reduction in CF related diabetes by four to five years that the onset was um, later. And then gastrointestinal symptoms, there isn't any um, change in what we can see in adults in their fecal elastase, so their pancreatic function, as we saw in Ivacafta, as Jackie had mentioned in the younger cohorts that were started on modulator therapy earlier. However, there has been some studies looking at um, fecal calprotectin, so that inflammation of the gut um, and how that would then impact the absorption, et cetera. And there is some seeing that there might have been a lower fetal cal protectin at six months post-treatment. However, um, there were no significant changes seen in constipation or diarrhea or changes in any of those obstructions. There is some speculation that the triple therapy may have a delayed impact on gut symptoms. So what we might see in a few years is that actually patients people that we see if they are starting on it as a younger cohort that we might start to see that same data coming through. Um, in relation to fat soluble vitamins, again, um, Jackie has alluded to some of those studies where there was an improvement um, in vitamin D levels. It is difficult to extrapolate and pull from that as to what was adherence. And we see a big dip in adherence as we see our adolescents coming to adulthood, finding you know, that they're tackling university, they're finding jobs, and, and then they come back into that adherence. So we see variations in vitamin D anyway. But um, there was an improvement seen in that. There is this improvement in an increase in vitamin A levels, although that is not standardized across the board, and we haven't seen enough data to say that actually we should be taking all treatment away. Additionally, um, with bone health, we haven't seen any evidence to show that there is an improvement in that bone health, so that reduction of CF bone disease. However, if we look at overall changes, we see that there's an improvement in nutritional status. So there's an increase in weight and BMI. There is less inflammation and infection. And so we see that there is less um, IV antibiotics, there's less need for steroids. And so that in itself, with that improved vitamin D, we should hopefully start to see that actually those are parameters that we thought led to increased CF bone disease. So hopefully we will see changes there. Um, along with dairy intakes and calcium levels, these are things that we need to keep looking at to then be able to treat accordingly. So adjust those levels as we need to and adjust treatment burden along with that. So um, as you know, we are co-chair of the British Dietetic Association CF Specialist Group, Dietetic Group, and we decided that we would send out a survey um, to people with CF in 2021, because we were concerned around what we were hearing and what we were seeing. So we wanted to get what you had to say. So it was sent to an adult population and I, we had 136 responses. And, you know, the data is there. We A lot of you came back saying that actually 80% of those responses was that there was significant weight increase. We had also alluded to the fact that there, we had obviously been in lockdown and was there changes with the weight in relation to that? Um, and that was less explained at that time. There were also um, highlights around body image and the impact of these modulators and their weight and bringing into the body image kind of focus, that there were skin issues. And, and we know that some patient, people with CF have experienced acne with these. Um, and then the impact on their mental health. In addition, we know that there have been gastrointestinal symptoms in relation to starting on the triple therapy in particular, 
Um, and these are with the areas that were highlighted by the people with CF, in particular, constipation and diarrhea. We know that modulator therapy hasn't necessarily made any changes on that gut kind of function, but actually there was a reporting of significant increase in, in this and the symptoms that were a burden to the people with CF, along with a, a big increase in, in bloating and wind and then stomach aches. Now, what we're not sure of is whether with the reduction in that focus on the lung health and that there wasn't, you know, that you weren't feeling as sick or whether there was that improvement. And so now suddenly those gut symptoms that were probably always there were now a highlighted factor or whether there was an adjustment of changing your hurt or your crayon intake um, and then having that knock-on side effect. And these are elements that we hope to see some more evidence coming through in the future. The other thing that struck me was some of the quotes and comments that came from you. Um, and some of these elements just really brought home to dietitians as to what we need to be looking at. So some of the comments were around, I eat more, my appetite has gone up. I'm trying to eat healthier and less junk food and sugar because I no longer need to count the calories to force my feed force feed myself to keep my weight up. I'm exercising due to the increase in weight and I'm feeling good enough to exercise. That I've cut down my calories from 5,000 calories a day to 1,600 calories a day and that I don't require as much junk food. Um, that we've stopped tube feeding. I'm eating more butter, chocolate, full fat yogurt. Now to take these tablets where I wouldn't normally have eaten these things at those times in the day. Um, and this was striking because obviously it's, those are things that people maybe are not wanting to do and the difficulties around that, um, that people are starting to look at calorie counting and going for lower fat options. After 32 years of someone nagging them to deliberately seek out the higher fat options and the difficulties that have come across with trying to manage that. Um, prior to treatment, I could eat anything with no repercussions, yet now excess food has its repercussions. The party is over. I have to have a sensible diet. And I've had to change the timing of my evening dose to have with my dinner instead of a snack with the evening so I could cut out the extra calories. And this is really relevant that we actually can adjust those timings and put them with meal times so that we're not having to increase that calorie intake. So what have we seen and, and in particularly what have I seen at, at our center? So yes, we have seen a significant change in weight and BMI in some of our people with CF. Um, we've seen significant increases from 10 to 20 kilograms within a three month period of time and where that has been placed. So we've seen abdominal weight gain. And that in particular is a significant burden on a person trying to with the, manage their sudden changes. There's, you know, weight where there wasn't before. And although people will see if maybe have wanted that, you know, to have a, a, a bum or to feel like they've got, you know, more weight around areas when it happens that quickly and that significantly, it is, is quite an adjustment. Um, we've seen in, you know, in some of the evidence with the body composition is looking at where that fat is or where that muscle is. And inevitably with that quick weight gain, it's usually fat mass that has been put on. In some of the people with CF, we've seen a weight loss. And this is due to them feeling so good that they've actually started to exercise more. And so there's been that change. And in some of them, we've seen no change whatsoever. It's just plateaued and stayed the same. Um, we've seen appetite changes and appetite. Uh, uh, um, people are coming to us saying, "We've, I can't stop eating. I'm, I'm hungry all the time." Now, this is not the triple therapy or the modulators are not appetite stimulants. It is a consequence of the changes due to that drug. So, the lack of inflammation, the reduction in infection, that reduction in mucus and sputum that you are swallowing, there is elements of improved smell and taste with that regard. And so, there is that um, that is trying to improve their appetite. And then there is this increased intake with that habitual intake that you have been taught all the time to eat without any knowledge of when you're eating or whether you're even hungry or whether you are doing emotional eating. Additionally, with the intake around um, having to take your modulator therapy with a fat containing food. And the misinterpretation that I think that has been put out there is that there we needed 20 grams of fat with each dose. Now there's 40 grams of fat a day. That is a huge intake of calories. And so that we've looked into this and the company itself does not have data to that. There was some looking at that do dose with the initial Ivacafta data, but there wasn't that recommendation. We have seen a change in the gut symptoms um, or an increase in gut symptoms where 
people have started modulators, so in particular Caftrio, where they've had diarrhea for two weeks, and then it might settle. In some cases, this has not settled at all, and how we have to try and manage that. We've seen constipation, and we've seen um, more fecal loading, so where you get that stool increasing in the gut, which then leads to increased bloating, increased abdominal pain. And there have been significant reports of wind, where there is people that with CF that have never had one before and now have significant amounts of wind and that discomfort, that embarrassment and how all of that has impacted on their body image and how they're managing these situations out in their usual environments. And that has had a big impact. And in some cases, people with CF have considered not taking the drug anymore. Um, there have been sleep difficulties. Um, and this has then an impact on their nutrition that they're so tired that they're having to then eat their way through the day to stay awake. We've seen with um, some glucose tolerance variations, we've seen where some people with CF have come off their insulin but gone on to oral medications, and we've seen um, some need increased insulin doses. So again, a variation. We haven't seen necessarily too many people with CF um, absolutely stopping all treatment. And so again, it needs to be looked at. Now, with all of this, it has an impact on the body image and how you with CF are managing these new changes, that lack of control, that lack of um, that ability to be able to change something quite easily and quickly where you would then have seen weight loss fairly quickly previously. So this has led to some dietary and medical treatment manipulation um, in that we've seen people stopping their crayon to try and get that malabsorption, to try and lose their fat that way. We've seen people stopping their insulin to again try and get and see that weight loss we've seen a diet culture come in with these fad diets and and this is relevant it's out there people in the general public are doing these so intermittent fasting keto diets really restrictive dietary intakes and we need to be listening as dietitians to this and accepting some of these so long as it is in within a safe environment and then we've seen that impact on your mental health the guilt the fear of the unknown, what is happening? Why can't I change this? Where I was so used to making changes before and are changing very quickly. If I got an infection, my weight dropped significantly. And that guilt and frustration around that of the consideration that I might wanna stop this drug because of this impact, that it's definitely imp impacting my quality of life and those thought processes and that lack of control. And that is very real. So what should we be doing? So um, the, in, sorry, in the patient-centered individual approach, and this is pivotal to anything going forward, we need to be ensuring that you have a safe space to bring these discussions, to open up about your concerns or even your successes and making that an ideal place for you to be able to bring those discussions. We need to be listening to all those ideas, those thoughts. We need to be looking into your knowledge on diet and quality of diets and what is a healthy diet to you and your knowledge so that we can then support in that education to provide you with the right information and evidence-based information. And we need to be accepting. We need to understand that you want to trial some of these elements that you see your peers doing or you've heard of on social media, so long as it is done in a safe and effective manner so that we can accept and let that go for a little bit of time so that you can trial and see for yourselves. We need to provide you with education um, and the education in the right format. So around healthy lifestyle activity, how you look at a healthy diet intake, portion control, um, how you look at mindful eating, when you eat, enjoyment of eating, that intuitive eating kind of principle where you have a, you start to develop a better relationship with food. You've had a, a for some of you, you've had a long standing relationship with food where we've just told you to eat and that change. We need to be able to educate on diet culture and how there is not sustainability with that, that actually a lot of the diets that are out there, the weight loss that is seen initially is not necessarily maintained by two to four years post that. And we need to be looking at functional measures and reviewing and resetting these benchmarks. So looking at that BMI of 22 and 23, it may not be relevant for each individual.
Now, I know we need to use that as a benchmark in the whole scheme of things, but if you've gone from a BMI of 15 to a BMI of 20 or 21, that is a significant jump. And additionally, looking at that family history, if you come from a family that has BMIs of 18, 19, and we are trying to push and exceed that to 25 or 24, then that's not necessarily the right and appropriate measure. And we need to look at how we work as an MDT to support you along with your family, your carers, your partners and friends. And how we then bring in looking at joining the physio to look at exercise and how we impact with your nutrition, um, linking in with the medical team to see how we manage your diabetes in that control and looking at possible joint sessions with the psychologists or social workers looking at, you know, costs and how we manage that food sustainability. So overall, definitely looking at it as a joined up approach and managing each of the queries that come along from you. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope some of these questions have been answered. My take home message is that we have an individual approach showing ideas on healthy lifestyle, reviewing our benchmark. It's not just about a number. It's sometimes about that, that actually you wanted to be able to walk five kilometers and you've achieved that, that strength, that muscle, that you are able to have open communication with your multidisciplinary team. And there are lots of resources out there. So to definitely look up some of them on your own and then bring them to your team. In particular, in particular looking at what the CF Trust nutrition leaflets are out there, um, their body image leaflet. There is lots of um, advice on healthy lifestyle within the NHS websites as well. And just bringing that back to your team and being able to share that and, and look at different options. So thank you very much. That's great. Thanks very much, Kerry. Um, again, another really interesting talk. And I think the thing that struck me is just how many different aspects of life with CF have had major changes and navigating your way through all those different changes, particularly you know, if you've only come to modulators after many decades without them, it can be a, a real change. Um, real, well, I'm going to introduce our, our final guest speaker of the evening, um, who's Sammy, who's going to share some lived experience of um, CF and modulators. Over to you, Sammy. Thanks, Rob. Hi, um, I'm Sammy. I'm a CF patient and I'm 42. Um, I've had 26 years of care under Patworth Hospital. Previous to that, I was under Ipswich Paediatrics. Um, I've got a 22-year-old son and um, life has been all right up until probably three years ago where my lung function dropped to under 40% and I was actually given Cafetrio on compassionate grounds. It's been um, a whirlwind, really. I think at that point, there was talk of transplant, there was talk of all sorts of things. I'd have to give up work. I was spending 12, um, sort of two weeks in hospital, 12 weeks out, continually on IVs. And it got to the stage where my quality of life had changed, really. And just got to the stage where when I started Cafetrio, suddenly life was changing. My energy levels were back up um, and, and life sort of, suddenly reversed. Um, I'm going to put them into sort of different brackets pre and post if um, if that makes sense. And then if there's any um, questions at the end, then, um, you know, more than willing to sort of ask then. So um, back in um, 2019, obviously my lung function dropped to below 40%. Post that from Cafetrio, I'm now up to 60%. Uh, I had problems previous with hair growth, nail growth, my skin, because of all the obviously the treatments that I was on. Now um, my hair grows. I've never had such long hair. My nails are healthy. I'm obviously on less medication, which means that my body is functioning better. I um, now don't have as much insulin. I was quite insulin dependent, mainly due to the steroids that I was needing. Obviously now um, my um, HP1 um, is um, in the normal range. So I've actually stopped my daily insulin, which has been amazing. And um, unfortunately though, my body doesn't naturally pr um, 
produce um, cortisone anymore. So I have to take a low dose of steroids um, because without that, my body wouldn't work. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not getting the um, high blood sugars, but I'm still getting hypos. Um, similar to what um, Kerry was saying, that, that that is something that's seen. So my body isn't regulating my sugars previously to, to how it was before. Um, my um, quality life is so much better. I now have um, a regular sleep pattern. Previous to that, I coughed and coughed and coughed at night. Don't cough at night anymore. I have a solid seven to eight hours sleep every night. So my quality life is better. I'm back working, which means that I feel I have a purpose again. Um, previous to um, Cafetrio, everything had to be planned. I had to plan holidays. I had to plan time with my friends. I had to plan everything, you know, from snacks to food, where now suddenly my nut, it's not normal. It will never be normal, but I don't have to um, plan every single thing. Obviously, there's still the intake of certain medications. There's certain um, amounts of fats, obviously, with the food, but it's... Um, it's so much easier to sort of control on a daily basis. Um, diet wise, um, previous to Cafetrio, I had quite a, um, I was still in the normal range of BMI because I absolutely adore food. I always have done and I've got a very big appetite, but now I have to actually think about what I eat. So I, I can't have three cakes because my BMI was creeping up and up and up. And within, I think it was two months I'd gained a stone. So suddenly it was looking at um, reducing what I was putting into food where previous I'd fill it full of cream and butter and um, high calorie things where it was a case of, you know, if I'm doing a pasta dish, for example, put a low cheese um, sauce rather than, you know, the higher cheeses, bar the two meals, obviously, where I'm taking my calf trio, where I need the um, fat content. Um, obviously, with um, the um, diet wise, I'm, I've sort of, um, I've, I've had to half my medication for my vitamins because my body obviously was absorbing more of the vitamins so I don't need to take as much vitamin intake now on a daily basis <coughs> I still exercise um quite um frequently I've always done quite <coughs> sorry I've um, come down with a cold today um I've always exercised as much as I can but obviously now because I'm sleeping better my actual <coughs> <coughs> resting heart rate sorry resting heart rate has reduced um I feel as if I've got more energy and um mentally that has obviously meant that I can carry on with the working week and feel that I can function there's not all the stress um body image wise um because I was on a lot of steroids I had a lot of bloating I had a lot of um bloating to my face and things like that obviously post um with the calf trio um I haven't got as much bloat and my body image has definitely improved um my body composition has changed I'm obviously not carrying as much water I'm um I'm carrying more muscle because I've, I've got the energy obviously to exercise previous to what what I was the only thing I have found which um in a way has been sort of a strange one. So because I coughed so much at night, I had really good stomach muscles and actually had a six pack. Since now I don't cough at night, I've lost that. And that is where I'm storing a lot of my fat. So I've sort of, I'm middle-aged now anyway, you know, like I'm in my forties, but I find now that I find it hard to, you know, that is that, I suppose, that mentalness and body image um, that suddenly I've got a middle, which I've never had before. Um, the um so I've made notes as I've been going along um yeah I think um I I carry a rare mutation as well as a delta fo8 so I don't know if it's my combination that is the you know how I'm how I get sort of the certain um aspects of different side effects you know I've, I didn't really have many when I started the treatment I had a very upset stomach for probably three to four months and I couldn't 
relate it to anything in particular. I was still taking my Creon, I was still taking my vitamins, but nothing was really um, working to not get, as, as um, the previous said, the bloating and um, the upset, you know, the upset stomachs and sort of um, malabsorption, really. It was, it was struggling to get into routine. I'm now two years into that and um, everything there seems all right. I also suffered with a really bad, um, almost acne rash down the sides of my face. That, that settled as well. I think it was just obviously your salt content is changing within your genes. So your body doesn't know um, how to store it in sort of any other way, I guess. I think sort of psychologically, mental health wise, it's very up and down. I always believe that um, eventually CF would take me and take my life where now I think it's a case that it's not going to be that way. You know, I will end up passing away of something totally different to CF. You know, it might be a side effect of the CF, but it's not actually going to be um, CF itself. Um, so I think you you have this guilt guilt thing that you're um, suddenly well again and people can't see that your previous, you know, I know CF is a hidden disease anyway, but you're, you've suddenly got this reverse um, sort of on your health and people looking, oh, you're well again. It's like, well, I'm not well. I've just got a different treatment that is, you know, helping me with my daily, you know, daily life so that I can live again. But I think because I haven't been in hospital having IVs for two and a half years, people just suddenly forget who we are. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it does send your mental health a bit up and down, but um, you just sort of, I try to stay positive and, um, you know, move on from there. But yeah, if there's any other thing that people want to know, you know, please ask. That's great, thanks, Sammy. Um, I definitely identify with yeah, lots of elements of your story as well. So we've got a little bit of time left. I'm going to try and ask a, a couple of questions to um, to our various speakers, um, but I don't think we'll be able to cover every question that's been asked. So as, as was mentioned at the beginning, um, if you still have questions after this, then the um, best to go to either your clinical team or to contact the, the CF Trust helpline. But covering what we can in the time that's left, um, we've got a, a, well, a question for Jackie. We've had a few various different questions about um, for children taking cafetrio, navigating um, increases in appetite. You know, is it going to come, and 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 how to um, help help your child to develop a healthy relationship with food to take their calf tree, but also to grow as normal. And, and so, yeah, yeah. So that, that, I've paraphrased a few different questions into one there. But. OK, well, I'll, um, first question is about how long does it take to improve appetite on calf trio? Mm. I've had huge variations. I, you know, I had a few adolescents in my clinic that were really, we would have, had it not been the fact calf trio was on the horizon, we would have had them gastrostomy fed. So we hung out for calf trio and, oh, two of them, it took, oh, I didn't see any improvement in weight and appetite at all initially. And I was like, oh no, it took, but it did take about six months for a couple of them. And we got there in the end, but, you know, it was hanging on thinking this is going to kick in sometime. It's got to improve sometime. And it did eventually. But other people I've had report who've said immediately, almost within a couple of days, um, I, 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 you know, they've said the sense of taste and smell. I can taste food now. I didn't realize food could taste this good. I had one boy who said, um, you know, I just didn't have the energy to eat. When I got up in the morning, I just, and now I feel so much better. I've actually got, I can eat, eat a bowl of breakfast cereal now because I feel so much better. So it does seem to vary. I've immediate response. And then I've had other ones that's taken months. But, you know, we got there in the end. It was a slow start, but we're there now. So I think you just have to stick with it. Yeah. Um, the other question about, I think, was to try and encourage a child to take, if they're not eating a toddler who maybe wasn't eating as much or didn't refusing to eat food or fat and not taking in their, or can be, or cafeteria in the morning. Um, I would say with that, I would view it as a, um, a long-term option. It's not a, a sprint, it's a marathon to use that term or phrase that you know, this is a drug that we're gonna have, be taking for hopefully the rest of our lives. Um, I think if you push a toddler into trying to take something and eating it, it, 
you know, toddlers, we know will always win the battle over food. If they don't want to eat it, they're not going to eat it and take it. Um, I've got a little boy in my clinic at the moment who is running rings around his mum, refusing to take the Ocam because he won't eat it. We have struggled for months. After about nine months, we're getting there. So I would say don't push it. The last thing you want to do is to put your child off this. Take the long term view. If you get it in one day and if one day they're refusing point blank, don't stress, don't push it too much. Um, but even you know, consider other options. It doesn't have to be a high fat food. Could it be something as simple as a, a, a milk drink? I've got some children, again, this is something we need to discuss with a dietitian in your clinic. I've got a couple in my clinic that just don't do breakfast. We don't eat, we've never eaten, we don't like breakfast. And I've got them taking a milky supplement drink, um, not even the full amount, just a small amount to try and get that um, or can be or calf tree in with sufficient fat. So it's maybe thinking of other options that maybe aren't traditional breakfast foods to try and get them to take it. But don't push it, it will happen and, and just take the long term view on it. That's great, thank you. Um, I suppose uh, while I was talking generally about this, you know, the need of having some fat with taking the tablets, I mean, I thought I'd, I'd share in terms of what I do, um, which is um, in the morning, um, I, I get the majority of the fat I need to have with the calf trio from a small yogurt pot, but I do try and supplement that with maybe some nuts and some fruit to, to make it a bit more of a balanced um, meal to do it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and then in the evening, I do what, what Sammy says um, about sort of trying to uh, d double up with when you're having a meal anyway, yeah. because, you know, a yeah. lot of meals probably contain sufficient fat. So I think if I pass the question over to Sammy, just um, if you wanted to expand any more about how any other tactics you do for trying to get that required fat for taking the tablets. No, exactly what um sort of same as what you've mm. said really. It's it is just trying to get that balance. And where we've always had that high um mm. calorie diet, suddenly we've got to sort of try and adjust. And um I still want three pieces of cake. That's my problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Yeah, <laughs> mm. yeah definitely. And I mean, I think as, as Kerry mentioned in her talk, it doesn't um just because it needs to be some fat where it doesn't mean it has to be a pure block of fat it just needs to be fat containing food so uh, like Kerry maybe and just if there's any more to say about um you know finding a a sort of more balanced healthy way to incorporate that fat but doing it in a, in a good way yeah thank thank you Rob um I think unfortunately there has been so many um I think out there in social media and also what kind of what was happening a, a, across in the states and a lot of people have been told varying uh, amounts of fat so there's from 10 grams 12 grams 20 grams and it, the the data just isn't there there isn't anything that absolutely stipulates that however the the Ivacafta original you know trials did look at giving those patients 20 grams of fat and so therefore that absorption of the Ivacafta was you know consider that that was the the good idea but when you consider that um in in real life terms you're adding you know kind of five to seven hundred calories a day it can be huge so um the company I've double checked this they have said anything fat containing so when you get your information booklet in there gives you some ideas and a pot of yogurt a glass of milk um some cheese a couple of nuts or if you are able to do it within that time frame. So ideally you need to take your modulators 12 hours apart. But if you are really struggling with this, then chat to your medical team. And in some cases they can adjust that slightly. They can look at the window as to how you can fit that in with you know, school, with work, with university, with life, and then looking at what is good for you and, and looking at the types of fats. So I think, Rob, your your idea is a great one. It's looking at a overall, you know, you've got your protein, you've got your fat, you've got your vitamins and minerals coming from your fruit, you've got fiber. All of that is a, a kind of overall healthy idea and you're getting enough fat in there to be able to manage that, um, taking your calf trio along with taking it with your creon to increase that absorption. And the reason we really are focused on that is if you don't take it with a fat containing food or without your creon, then you can lessen that efficacy, that effect of that drug by fourfold. However, 
if in the case where your your child or your adolescent is saying, I don't feel like eating this morning, I just don't, taking it with water that every so often, it's not going to be detrimental. We'd rather that they took it and kept that habit up. But just being rational about it and thinking, okay, today I'm, I, I, I've got to pick my battles. Today is not today. I'm not picking that battle today. Just get them to take it. And if they can drink something, if they do like a milky-based drink, then go with that. Um, and then looking at kind of healthy fat options, you can absolutely get in touch with your team to look at, you know, making those specific ideas. It's very difficult for us to give a broad spectrum of what would be your ideal, but definitely looking at smaller portions. It's just something that has some fat in it and then taking it with your enzymes to go with that. That's great. Thank you. So um, we're at three minutes past eight, so, but before I finish, I just wanted to ask one sort of question of my own which is we've seen lots of interest from lots of people about research 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 now that we've got these modulators and you've included results of various things in in both your talks um Jackie and Kerry um I was just wondering is, is there a good good place where maybe people might be able to find out what trials are going on what what results come out from the different trials or and maybe if they wanted to actually participate in one what's the best way to sort of engage with 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 with, with the research relating to cf and nutrition um well this the cf trust um and also as dietitians we do try to use twitter a lot as well so that last questionnaire that we did carry didn't we was out on twitter and that's how we recruited some of the adults to respond to that so that's um quite a good we've got a, a twitter account the cf dietitians interest group so we, we do put out calls out like that. Um, I know Nottingham also have a Twitter account and they're often looking for um, people to go on to studies as well, aren't they? Um, Rob, generally, um, the, each CF centre will be advised as to what trials are out there. So also looking at whether, you know, new modulators and new trials from that perspective or any trials that are, are coming in relation to gut health or uh, microbiome or anything like that then the CF Trust will also know that. But additionally, your teams will have information on that. So it's about just, you know, saying to your team, oh, if there are any trials, um, could you could you give me a heads up and and remind them each time you speak with mm -hmm. them? Because <laughs> obviously it's not always at the forefront of our minds. But yeah, there are loads going on. And I think especially now there will be so many more coming in in the new near future. Mm -hmm. So definitely approaching your teams or the CF Trust to try and help out with that. That's great. Thank you. I could just see it in the chat. Um, the other, other Jacqueline has, uh, has given us a link to uh, the CF trials tracker. And that's, that is a great resource mm -hmm. if, you, if you're interested in trying to keep up to date on that stuff. So um, I don't think we've really got time for any more questions, but um, I just wanted to finish off by saying thank you so much to our three guest speakers, um, Jackie, Kerry and Sammy. I think it's been a great, a great session, Le learned an awful lot and it's really interesting to hear you know, your different sort of specialist perspectives of, um, you know, from your different areas. So um, just to finish off, I'm going to hand back to Arthur Jacqueline just to round off, uh, but it's been great to see everyone tonight and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rob, and thank you very much to all of our speakers um, on the panel tonight. I think that's been a really interesting an informative session. I'm sorry that we didn't get through all of the questions. I think it just speaks to how much information there is about this area. And certainly I think we can um, look at potentially running another event uh, in the future, looking specifically at, at modulators and nutrition. Um, I just wanted to highlight actually very quickly some of the upcoming events that we have. I mentioned that we have got a nutrition series. Um, so um, starting in November, We'll be having a cost of living event, um, looking at eating well and meal planning on a budget and um, ways of maintaining calorie intake when finances may be stretched. And then we'll also be um, picking up the sessions again in January. So we'll be having a session on CF diabetes on Wednesday, the 18th of January, and then some further sessions on mindful eating, on gut health, and also on exercise nutrition um, in February, March and April. So we've got lots of things to look forward to.
Um, and also just to flag that next, um, on Wednesday, the 19th of October, we have a CF Live, which is all about ageing and cystic fibrosis. And that will also include um, a mixture of um, clinical experts and also experts through their own lived experiences of CF on that panel. So it should be a really interesting one. Um, the topics that um, are put forward for these sessions were all suggested by consultation that we do with our community through our involvement pool and through social media. We're really keen to hear from you um, as to how you found the event this evening um, and what kind of subjects you'd like us to cover as well at future events. So um, if you could please look out for a short feedback form, um, we'll send that out shortly and be really grateful for any feedback that you may have. So I'd just like to thank you all for coming um, and for all your questions and comments and also to, to thank our panel again. And uh, we hope to see you at one of our future events. So a good evening to everyone.